From a young age, we're taught fidelity to the system and to the state. We all grow up saying the Pledge of Allegiance in school, but the words under God we take for granted. Those words were added to the Pledge of Allegiance in 1954 to exclude American communists. Communists, of course, are godless heathens. That piece of history is largely unknown, but the ideology behind it is probably the most known idea in American society. This town may appear to be an accurate likeness of a typical American community, but it's a fraud. It isn't free. Socialism has spread the shadow of human regimentation over most of the nations of the earth, and the shadow is encroaching upon our own liberty. If a person defends the activities of communist nations while consistently attacking the domestic and foreign policy of the United States, she may be a communist. Now that you become acquainted with the enlightened communist system, in contrast to the outdated capitalistic way of life, you are now prepared for the next step of your indoctrination. You won't have to worry about next year. The state will do your planning from now on. And we'll overthrow it by force and violence. We'll have our way if it means bloodshed and terror. Because the news about communism is getting around. And it's only another word, sleep. In almost every industrialized country in the world, socialist parties have huge representations, large membership bodies, and hold many elected seats in government. But in America, everyone knows that being called a socialist or a communist carries an immediate negative connotation. The term is frequently used to smear people in groups, not necessarily for being one, but merely for associating with one. So what is this unacceptable ideology? To find out, I talked to a founder of a socialist organization in the United States, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and longtime socialist organizer Brian Becker. People think Karl Marx is the originator of socialism, maybe modern socialism, but you look at early Christianity, early Islam, the early uh, tenets of Judaism, a lot of it has a yearning for the old days, the yearning to go back to primary or social existence where there's cooperation and equality. Socialism is the ideology reflecting the desire by people who want change, people who want to get rid of the evils and the injustices of the capitalist society and replace it with a new society, a society based on public ownership. And public ownership means that instead of the corporations and the banks and the wealth, all that which is created by the labor of human beings, working people, instead of that wealth being accrued and accumulated by a small percentage, it is used for society's needs. In the United States Constitution, people are given political rights. It's the homeless get the right to vote every two or four years, but they don't have the right to a home. The socialist program is everyone must have the right to employment or an income if they can't work. Everyone as a guaranteed constitutional right must have a, a place to live that's affordable. And healthcare should be free, and education should be free. Now those four things that's the hallmark of the socialist program, that's been demonized, but if you ask most American people, certainly the have-nots, they'll think, yeah, those are pretty good things. And what are socialism's roots here in America? Well, socialism has very deep roots in America. Most Americans don't know it, but the rise of the kindergarten, the rise of public education, the rise of something called social security. That is, when you retire and are no longer productive, no longer able to be employed by a capitalist productively, you should not be li living a life of poverty, social security. The idea of unemployment insurance, meaning when you're laid off, not for any fault of your own, but because the capitalist system routinely goes through economic recessions and depressions, you should be cared for by an unemployment insurance. These are the ideas that originated with the socialist movement. In the late 1800s, there was an intense battle between organized labor and the country's industrial capitalists. With socialists in the leadership, the labor movement was on the cusp of winning the eight-hour workday and the corporate owners were willing to do anything to keep working their workers to the bone. 
Workers on strike all over were shot and killed by police during this fight for what seems like such a basic human right today. In 1887, seven anti-capitalist leaders in the movement were sentenced to death on trumped-up charges, four of them publicly hanged. It was a clear message to anyone involved in radical politics. The battling ideologies of capitalism and socialism in America is more than just opposing arguments. It's been a real battle with real weapons, where one side was exiled, sent to prison, and murdered. Anti-communist paranoia continued to build Struggles that outraged the rich, like child labor laws and women's right to vote, were labeled red plots. President Woodrow Wilson was helping push for new laws that officially criminalized opinions, not deeds. In 1915, in his State of the Union address, he declared, There are citizens of the United States who have poured the poison of disloyalty in the very arteries of our national life, who have sought to bring the authority and good name of our government into contempt. Such creatures of passion, disloyalty, and anarchy must be crushed out. And the mission to crush out anti-capitalist ideas was in full effect as World War I began. A coalition of socialists and anarchists who'd been leading the militant labor and anti-war struggle was a primary target. Over 90 IWW leaders were mass arrested and given lengthy prison sentences. Repression in the courts was reinforced by hired gangs and lynch mobs, allowed by the state to carry out vigilante actions. In 1917, the oil company controlled newspaper Tulsa World, printed on its front page, the first step in whipping Germany is to strangle the IWWs, kill them, just as you would kill any other kind of snake. And they did kill them. And that year alone, big businesses thugs like the Pinkerton gang lynched many IWW leaders. Frank Little, a popular IWW leader of mine workers in Butte, Montana, was beaten, dragged behind a car, and hanged from a railroad trestle. That same year, Wilson legislated the criminalization of dissent by passing the Espionage Act. Included in the US government's sweeping definition of espionage, suggesting that you shouldn't be used as cannon fodder in a war between ruling elites. In 1918, famous American socialist and presidential candidate Eugene Debs gave a speech in Canton, Ohio. He said, Wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder. The feudal barons of the Middle Ages, the economic predecessors of the capitalists of our day, declared all wars, and their miserable serfs fought all battles taught to revere their masters, to believe that when their masters declared war upon one another, it was their patriotic duty to fall upon one another and to cut one another's throats for the profit and glory of the lords and barons. They alone declare war, yours not to reason why, yours but to do and die. If war is right, let it be declared by the people. You who have your lives to lose, you certainly, above all others, have the right to decide the momentous issue of war or peace. For these words alone, Debs was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to 10 years in prison. The charge? Obstructing recruitment. Many others who did nothing but speak against the war met the same fate. During the patriotic hysteria, the Espionage Act was expanded into the most repressive law in U.S. history. The Sedition Act read, whoever shall willfully utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States, or the military or naval forces of the United States, or advocate, teach, defend, or suggest the doing of any of the acts, shall be punished. Over 1,500 people were arrested under this law. Those convicted faced up to 20 years in prison. Everything and everyone was a target. Books and feature films were seized by the government. Every postmaster in the country was under orders to monitor all mail and refused to mail newspapers and magazines deemed unloyal. Despite this repression, major victories were still won. During World War I, workers were able to win higher wages. But after the war, their bosses wanted those wages back. The captains of industry in America had just 
watched peasants and industrial workers in Russia rise to power. It had reverberations everywhere. People all over the U.S. stood up to the attacks on their jobs and wages. In a wave of strikes in 1919, one out of every five workers in America walked off the job. The display of power was formidable. U.S. Attorney General Mitchell Palmer, a member of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, along with the Justice Department head, the young J. Edgar Hoover, mounted the capitalists' counteroffensive. Palmer wrote in the case against the Reds, Like a prairie fire, the blaze of revolution was sweeping over every American institution of law and order a year ago. It was eating its way into the homes of the American workmen. Its sharp tongues of revolutionary heat were licking the altars of the churches, leaping to the belfry of the school bell, crawling into the sacred corners of American homes, seeking to replace marriage vows with libertine laws, burning up the foundations of society. While they have caused irritating strikes, and while they've infected our social ideas with the disease of their own minds and their unclean morals, we can get rid of them. On November 7, 1919, a date chosen to mark the anniversary of the Russian Revolution, a series of violent raids without warrants took place in 12 American cities, arresting hundreds. Months later, on January 2nd, raids took place in more than 30 cities involving federal, state, and local law enforcement. Every single socialist office was raided. Homes of socialists were also raided. Around 10,000 people were rounded up and thrown in jail in Palmer and Hoover's raids. Thousands of resident immigrants were deported for being communists. The raids became notorious for their extreme brutality. Such a massive operation dealt a huge blow to the socialist movement and was a clear message of terror to anyone who considered joining a socialist group. Similar state-sanctioned violent repression of socialists continued in the following years. Police departments formed official red squads, where police intelligence units working with business elites unleashed terror on party members. They conducted mass surveillance, raided their meetings, and ransacked their offices. As a Los Angeles police commissioner said in defense of their red squad in the 30s, the more the police beat them up and wrecked their headquarters, the better. Communists have no constitutional rights. Why did socialism become so strong and also so demonized and attacked at the late 19th century and early 20th century? Well, it was really about power. The, the socialist movement started to arise when the, the ugliness of urban, proletarian, or bourgeois uh, society, the, the working of 14, 16 hours a day, the working of children to the bone, the working of people so that they died at a, at a tender age because they worked so long, those kind of oppressions suffered by the modern working family, uh, that gave rise to a socialist movement. People who said, we work all day and for what? So that the capitalists, the big robber barons can get ever richer, we want ours. And that was the beginning both of the union movement and the beginning of socialist movements, socialist newspapers, and socialist parties in the United States. Despite repression over those decades, socialism in America still flourished. In 1912, there were 13 daily socialist newspapers. 12 monthlies, and 298 different weekly socialist publications. Eugene Debs, who ran for president on the platform of making the United States a socialist country, won 6% of the vote, over 7 million votes by today's population, and at a time when women and African Americans were barred from the ballot box. Debs' party, the Socialist Party, had 118,000 active members. The Communist Party, which had 8,000 members in 1929, swelled to 100,000 in just 10 years. Beloved figures embraced and joined Communist parties, such as Langston Hughes, Pete Seeger, and Helen Keller. Between 1898 and 1933, there were 57 different socialist mayors elected in 23 states, from Nebraska to Florida to New Jersey. In 1911 alone, 74 different U.S. cities and towns elected socialists as mayor or major officers. Still small relative to the population size, socialists in America made themselves felt by Wall Street with their militancy and uncompromising class consciousness. Fearing losing their power altogether, the empire's kingpins granted major concessions with the New Deal to try to quell the workers' rebellion. The movement at home wasn't the only thing scaring the elites. A rapidly changing world catapulted the repression. 
That was in a response by the elites in America to the Bolshevik Re Revolution. Here in Russia, you had poor people in the cities and in the countryside take the power, hold the power, and say that they're a socialist government. That inspired socialists all over the world. Socialists started in China and Vietnam and Korea, but also in America. And so the government came down heavy with the Pomerades to say, we're not going to tolerate uh, a, 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 a radical, general, a generalized radical resistance as evidenced by the Russian Revolution. So what happened in 1917 was the ruling class in America was panic stricken. It was stricken with the idea that this contagion of revolution could spread to the poor within the United States and that if they could organize themselves, if they could have a space to organize, then they could succeed as they did in Russia. From a historical point of view, I think it's really good to remember that when the Haitian Revolution happened, the slaves in Haiti, the first slave revolution, it had a, a panic impact on American, the American capitalist class, which at that time was a slave-owning ruling class. When George Washington and his Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson rushed money to the beleaguered white racist regime in Haiti to stop the Haitian Revolution in the 1790s. And in 1804, there was a kind of red scare at that time where all black people in the South had their movements restricted because there was a fear that the contagion of revolution from Haiti to the southern states in the United States could lead to a slave revolution. The era of anti-communism that followed World War II was fierce. In 1946, Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act. It was an unprecedented purge of socialist union members, of which there were many. Up until this point, half of the unions in America were under the leadership of socialists. But with the new law, every single union officer was required to sign an affidavit, pledging that they did not believe in socialism. If you didn't sign, you lost your job. Knowing that art could dangerously convey ideas, the government wanted to have tight control over that too. In 1947, the House Committee on Un-American Activities began to target people in the entertainment industry. Dangerous professions such as screenwriters, actors, directors, producers, technicians, authors, musicians, and others were all summoned to Congress and forced to publicly swear that they were not communist. Those who said they were were barred from employment and blacklisted in Hollywood. But you didn't even have to say you were to get punished. You just had to assert your rights, like the 10 screenwriters and directors who took a stand against the nationwide witch hunt. We are aware of a developing nightmare of fear in our land, in which increasing numbers of citizens are being forced to swear, I am not this, I am not that, I don't belong to anything, I don't believe in anything, I don't criticize anything. Loyalty oaths and loyalty boards, and nobody is loyal who criticizes the bipartisan foreign policy. Thought control entering the university campuses, educators being fired, film studios enlisting in the Cold War, labor leaders being framed on perjured testimony, lawyers sent to prison for defending their clients. All 10 decided that when asked if they were communist, they would refuse to answer. All 10 were sent to prison. For those who were open communists, well, they were just arrested. Under the Smith Act, it was deemed illegal for anyone to be a member of the Communist Party. And in a surprise attack, the state arrested everyone who held a leadership position in the party. All of them were sent to prison. Over a hundred were convicted of being communists and given sentences of up to six years, jailed for nothing but their beliefs. During this period, 5,000 communists were forced to flee the country. More than 1,000 went to prison. The climate was such that anyone who even leaned to the left was completely persecuted. But just to show how far it would take things in the legal system, the US government went beyond hard prison sentences. In 1951, Communist Party members Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were found guilty of being spies. But their sentences would be much different than their predecessors. The judge convicted them not for espionage, but for the murder of all the American soldiers who had been sent to die in Korea. On June 19, 1953, they were executed. It seems like there had been waves of anti-communism before World War II, and after World War II, it seemed like anti-communism was pretty much locked in. How did the Cold War impact the repression on the left here at home? After World War II, you had 
Soviet Union got stronger, China had its revolution, Vietnam had a revolution, revolutions were happening all over the world against colonialism. So the U.S. elites, bankers, politicians, and of course the repressive agency said, we're going to stop that in its track in the United States. We're not going to let it flower. Communism after World War II became synonymous with the struggle against the Soviet Union. Communism was treated no longer as an indigenous movement for social progress and social justice and equality, but a fifth column, an extension of an enemy state. And of course, the US and the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons pointed at each other. So if you were a communist, if you were sympathetic to the Soviet Union, sympathetic to socialism, then you were a traitor and you were treated as such. And that's what happened. Tens of thousands of people lost their jobs. Hundreds of thousands of people uh, were driven out of industry. People decided then and there, I won't sign a petition, I won't go to a demonstration, I won't have anything to do with the left, because if I do, I could ruin my chances for employment or education, and it could impact my entire family. That's what actually happened in the United States. The United States um, government has a lot of power. The US media, the corporate-owned media, has represented the view of the United States to the letter. And so the witch hunt that began in 1945, 46, 47, McCarthyism, became what I would say the unofficial religion of the United States. It, had, it was an article of faith. You had to swear that you renounced the devil, renounced communism, renounced socialism so that you could work, so that you could have a career, so that you could uh, thrive in any possible way. It became a rule for existence in the United States. And so you had not only censorship, but self-censorship. Millions of people decided, I'm just not going to identify as a socialist or a communist, even if I think those thoughts, mm -hmm. because I can't survive within this system. The vicious anti-communism of the 40s and 50s effectively snuffed out the left in the big cities, where the movement had always been strong. Finally, the plutocrats felt safe from the pitchforks. But a challenge to the system's white supremacy suddenly reared its head in the rural South. In Montgomery, Alabama, a new mass movement was born. The state used its weapons of red baiting, violence, and imprisonment, waging an all out assault on those who wouldn't accept the status quo. It was used as a tactic to, to negatively demonize people in the black liberation struggle. So, uh, and it was effective. So, if uh, um, black leaders or organizations started to become too popular or too radical, they were, they were labeled as, as red or communist, and that brought the state down on them. It, it made it more difficult for them to organize even within their own communities because of the negative propaganda associated with communism. To what extent did the state go to suppress black liberation movements in the 60s and 70s? The state was involved in any number of physical uh, uh, um, um, attacks on black liberation leaders and organizations from shootouts with the Black Panther Party, straight out assassinations of leaders like Dr. King and Malcolm X, uh, both of whom uh, have had their, their high profile assassinations um, with strong documentation uh, uh, decidedly attached to uh, this state being involved, um, uh, directly or indirectly. Political imprisonment is still rampant. Uh, many of those who were involved in those struggles are still locked down in the dungeons of the United States to this day for their involvement. The counterintelligence program, as it was famously called, was developed specifically to wipe out uh, all manner of the left and, and was targeted directly, specifically at the black liberation struggle. Why do you think the most radical left and socialist elements of these figures are left out of the narrative? You know, I was in a letter writing exchange with a political prisoner, David Gilbert, not long ago, one of the... the uh, um, still imprisoned white members of the black liberation struggle. Um, and this question came up, and his response is one I tend to agree with, that the scientific element of the struggle was attacked so that we would be left with nothing but uh, those engaged in mysticism uh, uh, and other forms of, of organizing and leadership, that is, so that all of those who are engaged in the hardcore science of understanding uh, how capitalism works, how imperialism works, uh, how violence and media associated with those, those enterprises work uh, uh, and who, who decidedly put in their program a redistribution of goods and services and targeted the economic structures that continue to create the inequality that we still deal with, all of those people were, were uh, attacked and still are attacked, if not physically, in their life or through imprisonment, you know, uh, holding their physical body their memories and their ideas are attacked uh, posthumously. Even after death, 
those who are hostile to the state will be turned into, as I think Lenin called them, sycophants of the state uh, in, their, in their afterlife. And their, their memories will be distorted to have them be propped up as, as one who would have supported what was going on when, in fact, they dedicated their entire life to destroying it. The government's offensive with COINTELPRO was devastating. It targeted all socialist organizations and black liberation groups. It worked to put spies in every single black student union and every college. Tens of thousands had their homes ransacked by the FBI. Through this mass surveillance operation, the government used a wrecking ball of infiltration, sabotage, and even assassinations. But it wasn't just here. The United States launched military interventions in over 17 countries in the name of fighting communism, deciding the destiny and causing untold misery for millions. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the capitalists of the world declared the end of history, that capitalism had finally triumphed over socialism and would bury it forever. But if history has taught them anything, it's that even though they scorched the fields that grew socialist ideas, those seeds, though sometimes dormant, would sprout again. The Soviet Union collapsed 23 years ago. The pretext for fighting communism as part of an international fight against an enemy state, that's gone, that's vanished. Capitalism can no longer compare itself to the Soviet Union. It can only compare itself to itself. And we see within the capitalist society a growing hardship, growing income inequality, growing po poverty. One out of every two Americans lives in or near poverty. And so as a consequence of this economic division and the inability to justify the old anti-communism, there's new space opening up for socialism. And you see the Occupy movement. People said, we are the 99%. That was kind of the harbinger of the beginning of a new socialist uh, context. The Sanders campaign, even though I don't agree with Bernie Sanders on many issues, the fact that tens of thousands of people come to someone who says he's a self-proclaimed socialist and says there should be an end to in income inequality, that there should be greater equality, the fact that he's on the front cover of Time magazine and it says socialize this, comma, America, and that's not a bad thing, that means we're seeing a new day. The fog of anti-communism, the bigotry, the prejudice, that's starting to lift. And the Sanders campaign's success, surprising success, or the Occupy movement's sudden, spontaneous growth nationwide, these are harbingers of what's coming. This war on ideas and alternatives is still being relentlessly pursued every day. Even 50 years after the Cold War, the empire continues to wage war on every remaining country trying to build up socialism, refusing to let even one nation develop alternatives without the constant threat of subversion and overthrow. Because the last thing the system wants is an example that undermines its supreme truth. The inability to question this dogma is deeply ingrained. After all, capitalism is the bedrock of America. But like every other myth that acts as the glue to our society, this too needs to be challenged. The planet is in deep crisis, where war and inequality define our world. Unfettered capitalism and endless consumption cannot and will not last. The elite at the helm won't ever give up their security for the good of humanity and the old guard will use every weapon in its arsenal to maintain domination. The Empire's long war against any alternative that challenges this crushing reality is unconscionable. We have the right to criticize the system itself without being labeled shut down or worse. We can't let the rulers of this system dictate the boundaries of our discussion. Because in this era, where alternatives are desperately needed, we have to unite to marginalize their ideas not let them marginalize ours.